Good evening, everyone. My name is Eve Haskell. I am an interventional radiologist, University of Virginia, and the chair of um, a career in professional development. I am very excited to invite and welcome you all to a very special uh, evening in our keynote lecture series. Uh, tonight, we have a very special guest who I will introduce in just a moment, Dr. Geraldine McGinty. But I want to also highlight that at the end of the talk, we have three invited discussants, Dr. Jennifer Harvey, the new chair at uh, of radiology in Rochester. We have uh, Professor Sharon Hostler, who is uh, the retired first uh, woman dean of the School of Medicine at the University of Virginia. And we also have uh, Dr. Maureen Cohey, the first uh, interventional section chair at UCSF, women's section head, and the very recent new chair of radiology at the University of North Carolina. And the three of them are going to be co-discussants at the end, but we welcome everybody um, in the audience to be able to either then unmute or use the chat section. We'll try to bring you all in. So with that, I'd like to take a moment and introduce our speaker. Hopefully, many of you know Dr. McGinty. I will just hit just a few highlights so we can get started. She trained in Ireland. She did a residency at Pittsburgh. She did her fellowship uh, in women's imaging and mass general. And she has focused intensely and in depth and is renowned for her work in imaging economics. And she rose to the chair of ACR Board of Chancellors, the first woman to hold this position, which essentially is over perhaps what? 40,000 radiologists. So if you think of what it takes to be a five-star general, the ultimate single elimination game, this is the equivalent in radiology. We are very excited to welcome you here to talk to us together with our group audience and co-discussants on what it means to be a first. Welcome. Thank you. So I'm going to share my screen. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. And, and thank you, Ziv and Alan, for this invitation. It's a real honor to be with this group, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. So um, I'm going to keep my remarks relatively short. Um, I'm going to talk about 10 things that I learned, um, not just as board chancellor, uh, board of chairs, cha uh, uh, chancellor's chair, but really um, in my career. And uh, this, I will I'll just acknowledge this image, which is actually not me, but was one of the covers of our ACR bulletin. And enough people assumed it was me fighting off that lion that my husband very kindly framed this and I have it in my office. Uh, so um, this is not a CME lecture, I don't think. Um, I don't really have any disclosures, but I think importantly, there are no logos on this slide. And I just want to say that this is me speaking tonight. This is not the president of the ACR, which is what my role is now, or uh, the chief contracting and strategy officer at Wild Cornell Medicine. Um, I'm going to be fairly candid, and I'm really looking forward to um, a good informal discussion. We've all had a long day at work, and uh, I hope uh, all of you are able to, to relax a little bit. And as I say, uh, hope for a great exchange of ideas. So I think the first thing um, that I want to talk about a really important lesson that I've learned and one that I think has been um, hammered home, unfortunately, in the last year is that I really have to acknowledge being incredibly privileged. Um, first of all, in terms of being the first uh, woman to chair the ACR's board, I always need to say that I am by no means the first woman who could have done it. There were incredible women who could have and should have done it who went before me, and I very much stand on their shoulders. But just in terms of my own personal life journey, um, this little girl grew up in a not particularly wealthy household, but with two incredible parents who did everything they could to give me a, a great education. I grew up with free health care uh, in the National Health Service um, and really great, mostly free education. Um, I married a great guy and um, came here to the U.S. and um, actually we got a, a green card in the lottery. So I have been incredibly lucky throughout my life. And with that, in that regard, uh, I, I would like to spend a lot less time talking about what I've done and a lot more time asking myself, what more do I need to do to pay back all of that incredible privilege I have? And I think that um, those of us who have been given the good fortune of a professionally satisfying career really owe it to ourselves to think about what it is that we can do to contribute. And um, certainly when I was coming into being uh, the chair of the board, um, you know, we're really trying to get advice about taking this role on and hopefully knocking it out of the park. 
and was had the opportunity to speak to Susan, Dr. Susan Hockfield. And little aside about Dr. Hockfield, she was the first woman to be president at MIT. And she said that actually it was much more controversial that she was a life scientist than the fact that she was a woman. Um, apparently, and I'm not an MIT person, of course, but apparently uh, the life sciences aren't considered necessarily as serious as some of the other sciences. But what I talked to her about was this feeling that I, I really did owe it to um, to myself, to to um, to our community, to pay it forward, and and specifically asked her what I should do about advancing diversity because it did feel like. A little bit of a weight on my shoulders that you know I was going to have to carry that water as well as doing the job that every other board chair would have done, and she said, "Yes, I'm afraid that you're going to have to do that. Um, you may not want it to be the only thing you're known for, but if you don't make it a priority, if you don't pay attention to it, and if you don't if you don't keep paying attention to it, it's just not going to happen." And I was fortunate um, in my work to have incredible allies and, and people who were aligned. And obviously, Alan is one of them. And we've had the good fortune to serve on the board together. But there are grooves that are worn into an organization about how we select committees and how we assign projects to people. And it really does take an intentional effort to uh, to disrupt those if you want to have different people at the table. So first thing is, you know, very grateful for all I have, you know, working hard to pay that forward. The next thing I've learned is um, that not everyone is the same. Um, I don't know that my parents necessarily knew this meaning of the of the name Geraldine when they named me, but definitely uh, it's it's from either French or Old German and uh, means spear carrier or spear ruler. And um, if that woman on the uh, opening slide fighting the lion is anything to go by, it, it's definitely something that suits me. I'm an extrovert. Um, and if you're an extrovert like me on the call, uh, certainly, you know, the last year has been kind of tough. Um, but, uh, I've learned and actually learned a lot more over this past year that if we're going to put effective teams together, we have to think about diversity, uh, on axes far beyond gender and ethnicity. And we really do have to think about people's work styles and people's decision-making styles to get the best decisions. And, I was actually recommended this book by a mentee of mine. I, I do group sessions with mentees and uh, one who's a medical student said that she had been receiving uh, evaluations for her rotations, which weren't particularly positive because she was told she wasn't really speaking up enough. And, and she said, look, I'm, I'm quiet. I, you know, I, I'm very engaged and I just don't really feel comfortable speaking up so much. And another one of the women in the group said, you should check this book out. And, um, I really learned a lot from this book. I learned a lot about my husband from this book, despite being together for 37 years. Um, there's a lot of bias in our leadership culture around um, the values of extroverts. But if we don't recognize what quieter people and you know, introvert, extrovert may be a little bit too binary, but if we don't realize what we can learn from and what our decisions can gain from the input of people who like to think more offline or like to you know talk in smaller groups, then we are going to miss the opportunity for better decisions. And this has been a real uh, lesson for me. The next lesson I've learned, and this is certainly throughout my career, is that that you really get to tell your own story. And um, you know, it's very easy once you get to my stage in my career to tell a story of my pathway that's very um, sequential and sounds very intentional and as if I knew exactly what I was going to be doing at the next step. And I, I'm guessing there's nobody on this call whose career path has been like that. We all tend to wind a little bit. And sometimes I think we can feel a little bit embarrassed about the times when the job that you were going to get fell through at the last minute has happened to me and all of a sudden I had no job. Um, but you get to tell your story. And I love this example because I would love if we were in a room to have you guess which luminary radiologist told me that for three years of her life, her, the most exciting event of her day was when she got to put her son to bed for a nap and got to watch Days of Our Lives. That was Dr. Hedy Resack, gold medal winner of every society known to man and National Academy of, of uh, Sciences member. So, you know, it's okay to have your career be something that has gone in along a, a not so straight path. The next thing I've learned is that 
you really decide what's important. And obviously, uh, someone who's familiar to you all, a, a former chair of the department, told me once, Bruce told me, um, I, I wish I'd known how much autonomy meant to me. And I think that as we make career choices, um, you know, something, some, somebody very wise said to me this past year, um, think about when you're saying yes to all these things, what is it that you're saying no to? Uh, what are the things that you're not um, making a priority? And, and how are you finding time for the things that are important to you? So I, I think this is, has been a powerful lesson to me. But what I would say is that, especially for the, the, the women in the audience, where sometimes I think it can feel that because you're having to really think about flexibility um, to, to you know, be, to be with family or perhaps, you know, I, you know, all of us thinking about what do you have to do if you're in a two career family and you're making geographic choices. Um, a negotiating principle that I use every day, my day job at Cornell is that I lead the team that negotiates our pay or contracts. And um, one of my favorite topics in business school was negotiations. And I was very fortunate to be taught by um, a guy called Stuart Diamond. And Stuart is not only a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, but he negotiates all over the world. And his approach to negotiation is very much uh, about doing it with emotional intelligence and really thinking much more expansively about what your interests are and what the interests are of the person with whom you're negotiating. So really thinking about, you know, is it, is it, you know, time that's important to me? Is it um, the ability, as I did when I went into my private practices, the ability to continue my volunteer work with the ACR that's really important to me? Really think about, uh, uh, you know, expanding that list of what's important because some of the things that are incredibly important to you may be easy for the other party to give you and vice versa. So don't leave value on the table because you haven't taken the time to really think through what it is that's important to you. The next one is a little bit of a tricky one. Um, I, I have tended to feel that people who in a very well-meaning way often stand up and talk about, you know, oh, you know, you should bring your authentic self to work um, are often people who have had who are in the majority in leadership and that's often white men um and and that's typically who i've heard this from that you know you can you should bring your authentic self to work and i think for many of us and and i would say much less so for me than some of my my black colleagues or my colleagues who are from sexual minorities um the idea that you would be able to bring your authentic self to a meeting that you would be able to talk about your social life or your uh, what, you know, how you're feeling after, you know, perhaps one of the awful atrocities um, of, of the last year and, and beyond. It just seems unrealistic and, 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 and kind of ridiculous. But I do think, as I've looked back at my own career, that it is when I have been doing something I love and doing it sort of wholeheartedly and as myself, that that's when I've actually been most successful. And I loved this quote about Barbara Streisand in a wonderful article was in the in the Times uh, a few months ago that she hasn't changed. She has essentially been herself. She didn't fix her nose. She she decided she wanted to do movie projects and she did them. And she has built an incredible career. Now, let's say, you know, sometimes you're going to have missteps and it's going to be a little embarrassing. Um, although I will say that was a very brave fashion choice. And I do want to acknowledge that the, the pin on the head of that pin on which professional women, people of color dance in these sort of traditional corporate and academic settings is small. Our latitude for failure is smaller than it is for our white male colleagues. So don't get me wrong. I'm not, um, I'm not uh, underestimating the challenge. Really, the work that I see that I'm doing and that I know that many of you are doing um, to make leadership in healthcare more diverse is taking is to take that tiny head of a pin and turn it into a bigger platform so that we have more latitude and that we are we do expand our vision of what leaders look like. The next thing, and I, I think I, I've already alluded to this, is that um, again, given the opportunities that I've uh, been presented with. Um, I do feel an, a, a very um, pressing obligation to pay that forward. 
Um, I'll, I'll just touch briefly on the trope that I think I'm, I'm sort of tired of hearing, and I just don't give any credence to this idea that women don't don't necessarily help women. Um, I've dealt with people who haven't been helpful of both genders. Um, of, of, of you know, um, in general, I have found our community to be incredibly supportive, um, and I think it's something that um, you know for me is the reward for any mentoring that I've done. I all, The only reward I ever want is that you will then take what you have been able to perhaps do with the support that I and others have given you and pay that forward. Um, I loved this, um, which was uh, talking about the um, election of the first black woman as editor of the Harvard Law Review. Uh, and it's something that has stayed with me. Um, you know, I have a number of thoughts that I go back to every so often and the idea that you are not successful until you've brought the next woman up, and if it's just you, then we haven't we haven't moved on. Um, but I I'm, I've become probably more aware, um, you know, recognizing that white women have been the biggest uh, beneficiaries of affirmative action. That while we certainly needed to move on from this, and this is great, which is the uh, in 2019 uh, the, the first picture is 2017 2019. This is the president, vice president, and chair of the ACR. Um, we have our work is not done. That I've become, as I say, increasingly aware that I need to work harder to make sure that I am supporting the careers of people who've had different career journeys and who look different and have had different lived experiences from me. Well, I would say I am a work in progress on that, um, very much in the learning phase of being an ally um, and something I think we, we definitely need to work harder at. I want to talk a little bit about mentorship and sponsorship. It's something I love doing. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do. I have a lot of mentees and um, I try to be an active sponsor. It's it's um, uh, it's one of my favorite things is to connect people or to find the right opportunities for people. Um, but what I tell my mentees and, and the people I sponsor is that they should assume that they are going out with a jersey that has my name on it. And I know nothing about sports. And I just happen to have gone to the occasional Penguins game when I was a radiology resident at UPMC when they were doing really well. So, um, but honestly, sometimes that doesn't go so well. Um, you know, I've had mentees who haven't shown up for things. I've had mentees who haven't, you know, haven't done the work that they committed to. Um, and, you know, again, that's a risk. Um, and it, there is some evidence that it reflects on one's own brand when someone one has suggested either for a position or a um, or a, an opportunity doesn't do well. And in fact, actually, there's a risk, even if you're just recommending someone for a job, if you're somebody who's from not from the traditional phenotype, shall we say, of leadership. But I think for most of us, and, and certainly for me, it's a risk worth taking if, um, if it means that you can open the doors for people who will be the leaders of the future. I think it's it's important, and um, I think, Ziv, you, you mentioned this, I'm, I'm not a big fan of sort of structured mentorship where people are paired up. I, I do think it's ideally done in a more organic way. Um, I will say that I think we have to go the extra mile to seek out mentees from that sort of quiet group. Um, but I also think that, um, you know, it's worth doing. It's, it's, uh, and it, when, when it goes well, it's, it's an incredibly satisfying thing. And on the, on the flip side of that, I, I would say that, you know, while there's great value in having a mentor sponsor group who shares your lived experience. Uh, that there are um, there are incredible opportunities from people with whom you might think you have nothing in common. Um, I have my dad in here just because um, you know he was somebody who didn't get a chance to have an, an education and was really just the most incredible sponsor for me. Um, you know, somebody who um, well, I'm going to stop, but. The three men here are, are, are people whose lived experiences were very different from mine. Ron Hoy, who taught me how to read a chest X-ray, who was an Australian radiologist who uh, worked in Pittsburgh after retirement. He'd actually, at 24, set up a field hospital in North Africa for uh, Field Marshal Montgomery. Uh, Steve Amos, who was my chair at Montefiore, who, when I started my career, who sent me to business school 
and actually told me I was going to be the first woman to be chair of the board of the ACR. So well done, Steve, for predicting that. And Bib Allen, who um, was chair of economics when I started uh, uh, getting more involved in the ACR, who um, who really was the one who um, gave me the opportunity to be chair of economics and gave me the opportunity to be board chair. Um, you know, all incredible sponsors. So I would I would say look outside what you know develop a, a whole group of mentors and sponsors, diversify your portfolio in that regard. Okay, we're up to number eight. Um, this is uh, obviously the, the fearless girl who's in uh, the financial district, but the quote is from Reshma Sojani who started the organization Girls Who Code. And um, you know, there is definitely a sense that sometimes we have to be perfect. We know that women tend to not put themselves forward for a job unless they really feel like they tick almost all the boxes. Um, you know, we, we are, we do sometimes feel that we have to not only have work settled and I'm not a mom, but the kids have to be, you know, perfect. The home has to be perfect. I think the pandemic has definitely done a number on some of those, at least it should have done. And, um, I have certainly done plenty of meetings in sweatpants and, and slippers in the last year. Um, so I think this is something I've learned is that. We need to teach ourselves. We need to teach the girls who look up to us that, um, you know, we need to be adventurous and we need to take chances and take risks um, and not worry so much about being perfect. And in fact, I, I love this article. Um, I teach it to my business school class. Um, it comes from MIT as well. Um, Deborah Ancona and her group and actually talking about the fact that not only are we of by definition and completely leaders, nobody knows everything, nobody has every skill, but that if we don't accept that about ourselves, that we will fail to build the teams around us that can really make us successful, um, that we will, our performance will actually be less if we're trying to make out that we're, we're some sort of miracle person who knows everything. So this is, this is something that's, you know, really informed certainly my leadership and how I've built my teams in, in recent years. Um, number nine is about networking. And um, I would say that networking is sort of the, it's the foundation of building that diverse group of mentors and sponsors that you, that you need. And I know that for many people, networking just feels a little bit cheesy. And is it about kind of walking around with a glass of warm white wine and, and a set of business cards when, you know, when we used to get together in person? Um, it doesn't have to be like that. For me, what networking means is finding people either in my own organization or really anywhere who I think are doing interesting work um, and reaching out and saying, I'd love to have a 15 minute conversation with you about how you got to where you are. What do you do in our organization or in the organization in which you work? You'll find people to be incredibly generous with their time. People tend to like to talk about themselves. Um, and women, especially, um, I think do need to take a very intentional approach to this. Um, this article talked about some of the, the, the key attributes to effective networking. Um, you know, that it doesn't have to be dinner. It can be 15 minutes. Um, you're not going to keep in touch with everyone in your network all the time. Something will come up and you'll say, Oh, I'll be interested. I, I'd be interested to know what X, Y, and Z think about this. Um, and, and, you know, really do it in, in an efficient way. But another piece of research that struck me is that men and women need different networks and that all of us need a professional network. Um, but women especially need a squad. You need a tight group of people that know you well, that you feel completely comfortable talking to. That's who you're going to talk about that salary offer. And, and see how does that, you know, how does that match up? That's where you're going to talk about expanding the pie. What else are you going to ask for in that job negotiation? That's where you're going to talk about that creepy thing that happened at work today. Was it creepy? Should you report it? What should you do? Um, quick, not safe for work. That's what we were laughing at. Um, and then the last one, which I kind of, I kind of swore I'm even showing you this because it's, I have a lot of mentees and I'll ask them, and I'm so delighted that we have Jennifer and, and Maureen uh, um, and Dr. Hostler on this call, but I'll ask them, you know, what do you want to do eventually? Do you want to be a department chair? And almost 201, they say, 
oh no, I, mean, I don't know if I could do that. But I mean, I, I you know, I, I like doing interesting work and I, I like solving problems, but ooh, I don't know if I, they just don't feel comfortable saying, articulating their ambition. And this is something that I think those of us who've been in leadership roles need to normalize. It, it has to be okay to say, yes, I'd like to be president of, yes, I'd like to be chair of, um, you know, we really do have to make it okay to think big. And as uh, somebody again, wise said to me, own your greatness. That doesn't mean it's always going to be easy though. And people are going to say nasty things. Um, the, uh, uh, this was an anonymous email to one of my fellow ACR board members about the feminist jihad that I was perpetrating. This uh, was uh, from another uh, board member, basically implying that a more diverse board would of necessity be less capable. And this was coming from another woman in radiology. So you're absolutely gonna get those negative comments. Um, but again, it's, it's so critically important that we normalize wanting to take on leadership roles and being willing to bring what we know we can contribute to those leadership roles. And I'll just leave you with a last quote from Eleanor Roosevelt, which is that well-behaved women rarely make history. So, thank you. I have a reading list, so I will definitely send this on. Um, this is all the articles I've talked, to, talked about. So. Thank you. Thank you, Geraldine. That was incredibly inspiring. You know, you, you, you have to, <laughs> a giant audience. But I'm sure that there'd be a giant uh, um, roar. Well, um, I, I uh, thank you. As we go to the panel, and those of you who don't have dogs barking, I welcome you to unmute. We have three discussions, but I also want to point out that we have many, many accomplished um, leaders with very different perspectives who've joined us. I'm hardly going to try to read out a 69, but we have the Dean of Education. Um, at UVA, Dr. Pollitt. We have Vicki Marks, the past uh, president of the SIR. We have uh, Lee Jensen, an accomplished neurointerventionalist, and many other folks as well in different positions. So I'd welcome you all um, so that I can kind of be quiet and listen um, to, to start the conversation, please. Um. Geraldine, I'd like to just start by saying thank you for your talk. Um, but um, so many points. And I remember the time in my life when I thought all the white men had these straight lines that went up between the X and Y axis. And I just zigzagged. <laughs> and I remember finally learning how to have each of those zigzags be something really quite critical about my learning that, that helped me kind of finally get to where I was going. But it was very discouraging, especially in my 30s and, and early 40s. To, to think, and then to realize that the men were zigzagging too. They just knew how to write, do the straight line. <laughs> Great point. Thank you, Dr. Hasler. Yes. You know, you made, you made that point about men aren't embarrassed to make, to make their ambition known. We have a mm -hmm. senator who's now, you know, um, ashamed in public who had no qualms about stating his presidential ambitions. Now he's the most embarrassed, but you know, that's the opposite side of what you're saying. And, claiming that and stating that how how do, how do you get people to practically accept that and to do that is it the mentorship or what else can you give us any of you i'd love to hear from the other group from the other people in the group i think you practice and you practice it with humility and you practice it with your network of friends first so that you don't stumble and get embarrassed and don't finish the sentence yeah but i i think um geraldine uh that, that um you made a point of women sort of wait until they know they can do it. You know, I, I Dr. Hostler, you know, we, I, we had many conversations where I was like, I think I might want to be a chair. No, I really don't want to be a chair. Maybe <laughs> I want to be a chair. And, and she was just persistently supportive. And, uh, and Alan Matsumoto, you know, it, it's funny how our meetings were always at like four or four thirty at night, and and he would spend like an hour and a half like telling me all about what a chair was doing, and and really he was mentoring me to take this job, and uh, you know so I think um, you know mentoring does come in many different forms, and and you have to accept wherever that is coming from, um, but but we do sort of wait until we're confident that we can do it. I think. 
Yeah. And I think, you know, if you look at some of the criticism that has been leveled at the vice president-elect, oh, she's so ambitious. I know. Damn all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to just also thank you, um, Geraldine, for such an incredible and motivating talk and inspirational um, I think something I've noticed is um, with young women who come into radiology, which is a male dominated field, and then certain subspecialties, such as interventional, which are super male dominated, is there is this, you know, assumption that you're going to find your mentor you know, as a woman and and that is not always the case. And I think, you know, being open minded um, to not just seek guidance and sponsorship from, from men, um, but but even play, people who are not even in your time zone, you know? I mean, Alan Matsumoto, you know, carried my career. So, you know, um, I think there are several incredible um, individuals who are, you know, white men, and they are incredible advocates of, of women. And I think that it helps to have that other perspective, because as a woman, most commonly as a woman, you're more, you know, uh, you're, you're more um, prudent about going for that promotion or asking for the next level of leadership or pushing that boundary. And you certainly want to make sure you've done all your due diligence and you're really, really ready for it. But you need that other perspective to say, you just need to do it. You know, and see what happens, and um, and you won't necessarily get that if you're just going to someone like like-minded individuals who will say, "Well, maybe just wait another mm -hmm. you know, ten years, and then by then, who knows?" So, I just advise people who are interested, who just even think about, as Dr. Harvey said, who just even think about leadership, to just think big and go and talk to. The great leaders who happen to be men or happen to be older women or happen to be like from a different country and get their perspective. So I think that really rounds out your experience in life. I think that's a great point, Maureen. I didn't really talk too much about imposter syndrome and it's an important topic. Um, I have to say, I mean, I negotiate like contracts worth hundreds of millions of dollars, not a bother. I almost got paralyzed by the promote the academic promotion process. <laughs> it almost killed me. Um, but I think the I think having powerful sponsors and mentors or senior them because they believe you can do it. Again, they're not going to put you forward if they're going to think they're going to be embarrassed. Yes. Geraldine, I'll speak up, and I hope you all can hear me. I've got two devices going because I have a little audio problems. But the, I'm Susan Pollard. I'm in the School of Medicine at UVA. I followed in Fa Sharon Hostler's footsteps. I'm the Senior Associate Dean for the faculty. I'm a family doctor. Um, and I was chasing a rogue dog, so I may have missed a little of what you said, but when you talked about people saying, no, I don't want to apply for chair, no, I don't want to perhaps apply for promotion, the thing I always say to women, and it's women who say that, is, um, you're not doing this for yourself. You're doing it for everyone who's watching you. Because if you don't do it, if you don't get that recognition, if you don't accept that role, what how they interpret it is the institution doesn't consider you worthy of that. And so you really must put yourself up for promotion so that your work is recognized and you're recognized for all the people who are watching what you're doing and following in your footsteps, whether you're their actual mentor or not. Hmm. And that's convinced quite a few people. To, to to approach promotion. And of course, they're always successful. Um, right, we know that certainly in my own organization, once women put themselves into the promotion process, they, you know, they do well, um, again, because the people putting them forward are, are motivated for them to succeed. It's just, you know, and believe me, <laughs> I procrastinated for long enough. So. <laughs> The, the, the thing here is that without repetition and without pushing forward, these things will never be mundane. And that at every level, whether it's to become the president of the ACR, but to make the next step up into a small leadership position, these are a series of small steps of which examples can be seen everywhere. And that, you know, I, I, I can't imagine how you got to where you got, regardless of my background. But somehow there are a series of steps and all those steps are by people who've joined this evening, who've made those small steps to get there. Mm -hmm. You know, you didn't become a chair overnight, Maureen. You know, what were some of those kind of seminal things that 
that were marking events that allowed you to pivot, whether it was something that happened at UCSF to get you to be the chief or to make the next step or, or, or Jennifer or you know, Gloria and what you're doing now. I think you know you're right on, Zeve, and I think that there, that slide that had an animation of a woman like lending a hand and bringing up another woman, and I think you know I've definitely benefited from that, and 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 I think that I've tried to model the way, and and it doesn't, you know, and and I think that um, you know something that was said earlier is like it's incumbent it's incumbent on you to do what you know worked for you for others, and I think. And but with that comes also something that we don't always think of is that, you know, not everybody wants to be president of ACR or chair or dean and and that's OK. You know, I think that that's something that, you know, you're so like wired to like think of the next step and, you know, how can I get to the next step? And once you get to the next step, you're like, what else? And I think. There's some people who are like, okay, I'm done. You know, I think I'm good. I don't need to be president of the health system or something. And and I think just being honest with yourself and, and making sure that your life is fulfilled and that it has meaning and, you know, trying to pause and ask, why am I doing this? Why do I want to be president? Why do I want to be chair? Um, because we're here for a bigger purpose. And I think the individuals who are doing it, not just for themselves or for pride or whatnot, are the ones who motivate and they lend that hand and they have that moment where they're like, okay, well, it's not about me anymore. You know, I don't need to give all the talks or I don't need to run all the sessions. I need to enable other individuals. I need to create grants and programs to enable underrepresented minorities or women to come into this field. And that's when you start to create your legacy. And I think that's that's just the most admirable period in your life. You're talking about learning to take pleasure in other people's successes and not having exactly. to be visible for that. Yes. And that's a tremendous honor to be able to have that internalized and a certain ego strength and maturity, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think being chair is sort of the, the being chair is sort of the, the ultimate Sorry, I'm echoing from somebody. Sorry, I'm echoing from somebody. But I want to pick up on something that Maureen said about, um, you know, making sure that you're saying you, you're you're taking up the opportunities that are meaningful to you. Because I, I think that's another thing is, you know, that your life, well, you should say yes to a lot of things, right? Um, I certainly did a lot of things at the ACR before I found economics, not a lot, but a couple of things before we found economics. But then after a while, I think you do have to kind of look for that sweet spot of things I'm good at. I mean, there's always going to be things that you don't like doing that you have to do, but but try and find the place where you really are operating at your most effective, um, and 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 have the courage to perhaps either say no or pass those opportunities to the people who really are excited about them. You know, it may be from another era, but I think it also has to be fun. There has to be meaning. There has to be connection with something larger than self. But in the course of the day, it has to be fun. You have to enjoy the people you're working with. You 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 need to just be able to laugh out loud a couple times during the day, even in the, the most dire of circumstances. You've got to be able to um, ha have that way of release or you're not going to be, you can't maintain the intensity for very long. But it has to, you have to enjoy it. Great point. You shared that Hetty Reshack story, and I'll share a small one from being a resident at UCSF in a tiny little room looking at plain films of GU uh, films. And um, she would she went out and got a small television so we could watch the Wimbledon finals while reading out films. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Exactly. Yeah. That's that's fun. Fun. Yeah. You know. yeah. Yeah, so that is heady, but that's also understanding, you know, how to enjoy life while you're doing the most yeah. mundane role work. So, Geraldine, thank you for, um, as always, an inspiring talk. And I want to touch on one of the things you said. Um, you made a comment that that white women have become the biggest beneficiaries of affirmative action, and you really, really, you know created a renaissance for women, especially within the field of radiology. And you've done a nice job, um, and maybe some of the folks aren't 
aware, but you have a large social media following and you've used that of late to sponsor black men in radiology and highlight some of their accomplishments. So what, in your opinion, is it going to take to cause this renaissance and diversity to, to be broader than just women and start to include other underrepresented minorities? I think, thank you and I th for the kind words. I think there's a lot already happening. Um, you know, I look at programs like the one that Ada, uh, Alan has so generously sponsored with SIR, the GEMS program, to really, you know, capture medical students from underrepresented minorities, which I honestly these days call excluded from medicine minorities because, it, you know, I, I think it, we really do need to, 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 to own some of that baggage and history. But you know, Alan, you know, what you what you're doing with making opportunities available to those medical students for them to see, you know, how incredibly exciting interventional radiology can be. And we have a similar program at the ACR, the peer program. That's really important. But if you, you know, if you get to the room, the professional room, and, and you're the only one there, or you don't see anyone in leadership who does who so you I think you're going to feel less comfortable, less excited than if there are people who, you know, have a, a lived experience um, or if there's just a culture. I'm not saying that we need to have sort of a quota of, of everyone, you know, that you can relate to. It's about a culture that's inclusive where we don't just do all do one thing socially. We don't just all think one way politically that we, you know, that we are open to different viewpoints. Um and the the black men in radiology, you know, there are other people who've taken up knitting during the pandemic or making sourdough. That little Instagram project has been my sort of hobby. And I've been, as you say, sort of highlighting black men currently working in radiology, but also fascinating stories of, of people from the past. Um, uh, you know, there are some incredible, and I did one for women leaders um, over the summer as well. So I'm doing a lot of the history of our profession, and, and uh, there's some great stories in there. I had a quick question, if you could, uh, Dr. McKinty, um, just talk a little bit about the mentor-mentee relationship and what sort of the responsibility of the mentee is, uh, because I think a lot of mentees have, um, they expect uh, sometimes, um, uh, you know, the mentor to really put a lot of time and effort and that, you know, there's something that they have to give back to. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think some guide rules and I'm going to uh, open that question up because I'm guessing there are, there are many people who've got good, good advice there. I think it's, it's, you know, some basic sort of etiquette around, you know, if I put you in touch with somebody, then you need to let me know when you spoke to them and you need to let me how it, you know how it went and show up, you know, with my team jersey on. Um, if there's a project that you've committed to do with me and something's happened in your life that you can't commit to finishing it or finishing it when you said you'd finish it, you need to be open and honest with me and we'll figure out how to move through it. But if you don't, you know, don't, don't surprise me. <laughs> um, um, and again, you need to pay it forward, but I would love to hear from some of the other uh, leaders on the call. Well, I think um, I, I was exceptionally fortunate to be mentored by Jim Brink um, through the SCARD lead program. Um, and I, I think, you know, you, you don't just go to the call and wait for them to spill things to you. You know, you, you really as a mentee should show up with, here's what I'm working on and where I really need your advice. Um, and uh, so, so that you have some things, some questions to, that they can help you with. Um, and then when they uh, do volunteer, exactly, Geraldine, they put you in touch with somebody, follow through, meet with that person, learn all you can from them, um, and, uh, and of course, thank them, uh, you know, being incredibly generous of time. I was fortunate to serve as Jim's vice chair for two years, and what I always say about that time was that it was like getting another MBA. Um, what an incredible guy. So we're running a mentoring program at UVA. We're just in our second year, but it's uh, it's a dyad program with mentor and mentees. And we start with some of the very basics, but it's things like um, creating a mentoring agreement, saying at the beginning, what do we expect of each other? Who initiates the meetings? What's our cadence going to be? At what point do we sit down and say, you know, is this working? I also think another important uh, role of the mentee is to understand 
what the relationship is about and if the mentee's needs change, to be willing to have that conversation that says, um, I might need something different now. How can we change our relationship or how might you connect me with new mentors? So it, it, it very much is a contracted relationship is the way we introduce it to our dyads. And I think that gives some, sets some, it goes back, Geraldine, I love your referencing the negotiation card because we really built some negotiation training into that mentor mentee training because it there are negotiations that are going to go on through the whole process of the relationship so it's treating it as the business relationship it is that has benefits for both members um if they march together and, and negotiate the terms and commit to them and then stick to those commitments i want to also acknowledge that wendy horton our new ceo at uva has joined us and feel free to to jump in and share perspective please Uncomfortable pause. Sorry, I'm creating a technical stop there. <laughs> no, but I, I think that it's also important to remember that you have sequential mentors and you have different mentors. Um, and you may have many mentors at the same time. It's not It's not like having uh, a, an exclusive love relationship. Uh, you know, I, I think if you can be really clear in the relationships, um, maybe you have one mentor that gets you started or one mentor that, that shepherds you through the academic advancement process at a point in time. But you're going to need different people at different times. And I, I think that loosening up that definition of, of mentor is helpful so that people on either side aren't disappointed in the process. There is this work out there that says that women are perhaps over mentored and under sponsored. I wonder what the group think about that because I will say that I feel like I'm a more effective mentor, which may be just me being bossy saying you should do this and you should, but that feels like a more comfortable relationship to me. But I'd love to hear what the others think. Well, you know, I think that the very definition of mentorship is the fact that you're going to be someone who is their, their, if you were a national supporter and a national advocate, that you're going to be listening, that you're going to see possibilities and you're going to relate those. Um, and I, I don't think that's always carried through. I think it can stay very local and it needs, especially as women are moving through their middle career, they, they need to have the access to the places that you are, I am, were, was a long time ago, but that, and, and those opportunities are time limited and they're uh, also access limited and you, you're one of those conduits. Um, I think it's important. Uh, let, me throw, let me throw a wide thing in case this is of interest to any of you, but, but we have very accomplished people at, at peak career points with many accomplished, but to think what you want to express to the people on the call and who will listen to it afterwards who are in their first two to three to five years, who don't really see how to get to there and what are some of the very practical steps they need to do to sort of seek this guidance or sponsorship or steps they can be making in the next two to, to nine months? Well, I'm happy to start with a couple. I would say um, the networking piece is critical. That just have conversations with people. Um, the people who are in senior leadership at your organization, the people who are in senior leadership in the, in the professional societies uh, with which you interact, have conversations about their journey, and you'll start to, I think you'll start to get ideas. I also think it, serving on committees that aren't so sexy, to, uh, just being on, the, on our medical liability, going through some of the mistakes is one of the hardest jobs that you can, nobody wants to serve on those committees. And what you learn a tremendous amount about your institution and, and about what the values are within that institution. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that encouraging the junior people to take those opportunities, even though they don't look to be very glorious at the, at the moment, but they're, they're good learning and they're great networking. I just want to add to that. Um, I, I agree with both those comments. I think that we, in the times when we had meetings, you know, when you went to a place and every you met people in a different place than Zoom or WebEx, um, I think there is this uh, desire to find your friends or your co-residents or co-fellows because you're comfortable with that. 
I think you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable, whether it's mm. being on the stage, being on a panel, having to present in front of a key opinion leader and cite his or her paper, um, going to a, a mix and mingle and meeting individuals who can help you know, be collaborators with your research or educational endeavors, but being comfortable, being uncomfortable, if that makes sense. And that, you know, that takes a lot. And I think a lot of people presume individuals are extroverted, but oftentimes we're not, you know, after all, we're radiologists, you know, we're probably more introverted than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but to put ourselves out there and just like, meet and have conversations and follow up, I think if you can go to a meeting and walk away with, you know, one or two amazing contacts to either be a mentor or a sponsor or a research, co you know, collaborator, then that's, that's success right there. And then before you know it, you have this expanding network and, you know, you, you help them, they help you. And then it really does make the synergy and it's beautiful. You know, I look at this panel and I see Amy Taylor, Gloria Salazar, Anissa Majid, you know, um, I see Meredith Englander. I see women who I've met just because of meetings. I've never worked with them. We don't mm -hmm. even, have, we're not even in the time zone, but it's because we put ourselves out there and we were, you know, being comfortable, being uncomfortable. And I would just tag <laughs> onto that and say, take advantage of social media. We've already heard <laughs> that Geraldine really used Instagram during the pandemic. A lot of people connect over Twitter. I was connected with a bunch of younger women who talked about how they'd met mentors through Twitter. They'd follow someone, they'd retweet their tweets, um, they'd meet at a meeting and it's like they already had a relationship. So I think that's a great way to make those connections across time zone, Maureen, that you were talking about earlier. So I think, um, you know, my, my sort of philosophy is uh, five words, say yes, be a closer. <laughs> So, and I, and I say that because I think, you know, especially early in your career, you have to be willing to try different things until you figure out what you like doing. Do you like doing different types of research? Do you like doing education? Um, do you like doing the political side? Um, be willing to experiment. But when you commit to a project, finish it. Because if you don't, people won't ask you again. And... Um, and uh, about networking, you know, it. I, I think it is hard to reach out sometimes, but I think especially for people who are younger, you know, like if I get a meet, an email from somebody that I met at a meeting, who knows when, and it says like, I think I met you at a meeting once and I want to ask your advice, I am always going to answer that email. You know, so it's not like we want to help, you know, when you move up, if, if younger folks reach out for your advice, you're going to help them. So, um, so I would encourage people to do that, even though it's like, oh my gosh, they're not going to know me. It's totally okay. You know, I, 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 I think the best news program on television is the PBS News Hour. And you think of what it was when some of us grew up and it was in the McNeil Laird News Hour, and it was all white guys. And Gene Woodruff has single handedly remade it. And you don't watch it and think otherwise. It's simply routine at this point. And it's intentional, but it's mundane and routine. And I think that's what, when you talk about normalizing this by continued examples and sponsorship, that's the thing that I'm hearing as the outsider on in, in the group tonight. Well, you know, I started a, a, an initiative that we called Rad XX and um, we were asked, would we make it a nonprofit? Would we have, would we have, you know, an MOU with different organizations? And what I said was, I don't want it to have any structure and I don't want it to have any governance because frankly, I want it to be obsolete as soon as possible. Um, I, I, you know, I think, as you said, Steve, normalizing this, um, not that there isn't always going to be value in, you know, I think affinity groups and, and as I say, you know, share, you know, sharing lived experiences with people who, who understand yours. That's always going to be appealing. But, um, you know, I hope that this talk becomes, you know, a, 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 an antiquity fairly soon. <laughs> it won't. <laughs> for many, for, for many reasons. We said that 40 years ago, we hoped it would be. Uh times would be over. Uh, they continue to evolve differently. 
and have different and different needs. You know, Geraldine, you didn't mention much about law about your time in business school, and where I know we're coming to an end, but I learned a lot from those guys and 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 at Darden. I mean, just a, about how to think about the world, and about scholarship that I never would have seen in any other place. Um, and it's, uh, you know, we're, there's more of it, the MD, MBA programs, but I'd be curious about highlight from you from that. Um, it was a game changer. Uh, and I don't, you don't have to be an MBA to be a physician leader by any stretch of the imagination. And there are plenty of ways to get that, that content. But exactly what you said, Dr. Hoster, it's, it, it's a different way of thinking a different way of approaching problems. And I think spe specifically, and I trained in a very hierarchical medical system in Ireland, but it's what was key for me was understanding that that incomplete leader concept and the idea that you need to put a team around you. You are not, the, you, might, you, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room as long as you put the right team together. Give us the advice to the men on the call so that we can be better as well. Practical thing for us because well, that's um, one. <laughs> I would say the ones that, that those of you that I know keep doing what you're doing because you're incredible advocates and 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 champions. So keep doing what you're doing. Keep listening and keep learning. Right? Mm -hmm. Take the risks. Be uncomfortable. I think, like us. and I think also realize that women do often take a different trajectory. You know, we're taking those zigzags on purpose, and maybe we'll end up in those leadership positions later. Um, that's okay. I want to ask a question of the group. Um, we talked about mentorship, sponsorship. This morning, uh, I had an opportunity to participate in a great session that Sue Pellet led about coaching. And, and where does that fall into this discussion for men and women about coaching? So I, I don't know, Sue, I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot because you sort of led the session. It was so fantastic this morning. Maybe you can share with the group. Sure. Yeah, we brought in Lottie Derby, who is at Mayo, who's done a lot of work on, on burnout, as you know. And Lottie has done some recent, re Lottie and her team has done some recent research looking at coaching as a way to mitigate burnout. Leader coaching, so hmm. organization, organizational leadership coaching and a coaching approach to to um, relationships with their supervisees and how uh, th how that can really decrease burnout and increase engagement for approaching. So we really talked about coaching is um, not giving the answer, so not advising, not mentoring, but helping the person who's struggling with a problem uh, explore the answer to themselves. Um, and we talked about professional coaching, but we also talked about peer coaching and how in ELAM was one example Lottie gave because she's in ELAM now, how their small groups do coaching. So Geraldine, yeah, experience with coaching, I'm sure you're her, Sharon, referencing Sharon's question. I'm sure there's a lot of discussion of that in your business school training because it's very, uh, very um, common in that group. It, it is now. I mean, I went, I graduated in 2000 and um, what we do for our business uh, school students at Cornell, yes, they get personal executive coaching, they get team coaching about, you know, not only sort of building their study groups, but, but how to build their teams at work. And I think it's an essential part of the program. And it's certainly something I've used during my own career. Yeah. So Vicki Morris had put something in chat with because her audio wasn't working, which were a couple of points. Um, the quiet book is awesome. And also wanted to emphasize that people shouldn't give up that Vicky applied to be the SR president five times. And finally, to be a bit oblivious to what people think as you move along your path. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Vicky. So I'd like to personally thank all the speakers for uh, joining us and sharing your wisdom. Jared, in particular, thank you for your um, motivational. Ten, top 10. Uh, I, I learned a lot just listening from that um, and very much appreciate the, the information you shared in such a vulnerable way. It, it's sort of very endearing. So thank you. Well, thank you again for the invitation and I learned a lot. Um, thank you for assembling this incredible group to, to talk tonight. It's been very inspirational. Fantastic. And I know it has for everybody. And mm -hmm. I'm going to take a moment to plug our next February 10th, um, uh, which is loosely entitled Yes, You, Tackling Anti-Racism, Self-Insight, and Self-Awareness and Vigilance. 
We have Sanford Wallace, who's on, and we have uh, Carolyn Meltzer and Alex Norbash. And we're going to have uh, a great conversation about thinking about this from a fresh look as well. So that's February 10th. Spread the word. Thank you, everybody. This will be recorded so you can share it with everyone. Have a lovely evening. Be blessed. Be well. Be vaccinated. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Jennifer. Oh, my pleasure, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Good. And thank you, Geraldine.